Thank you so very much. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So uh, I uh, head up customer success here at Red Panda, and we'll be talking about Graviton and ARM and uh, how that compares to x86. So just a, a quick sort of overview of what we'll be covering. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Graviton story uh, and where that originated from. Uh, a little bit about Red Panda and you know what is Red Panda and, and why is this interesting in the context of the comparison between the two different architectures. Uh, Red Panda is written in C++, so we'll talk about some of the implications of that and also the thread per core model that we have within Red Panda um, and how that affects things. Uh, we'll also, then we'll get into the benchmarking of ARM versus x86, talk about conclusions, and then have any, uh, you know, answer any questions that might come up at the end. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about Graviton. Uh, you know, Amazon, uh, you know, we, we've all used ARM processors uh, if we have a mobile device. So we all have uh, some familiarity with, uh, you know, with ARM chips or, you know, Raspberry Pis and other things from that perspective. But uh, Amazon sort of first started with Graviton in 2018. Um, these were pretty, you know, it, it was interesting to see what they were doing in 2018. Their, uh, the performance was still kind of in the early stages. Uh, and very quickly after the initial launch, Graviton 2 came out a year later, which was actually a 50% performance improvement on the original Graviton launch. A few things that are different with ARM versus uh, what we typically get with Intel instances inside of AWS is that every core is a physical core inside of ARM. So when you know, when we're seeing something that says vCores or other things like that, um, you know, in the instance uh, information for <clears throat> these Graviton instances, you know, these are actual physical cores and they're not a hyper-threaded core like we typically are uh, used to when we're looking at the Intel instances where, you know, two hyper-threaded cores is giving us a, a full physical core. This, you know, all of this was pretty interesting to us as a company, um, as, you know, as Red Panda, as we're, you know, very focused on performance and also cost of performance. Um, but we didn't really get interested into this space until uh, AWS just recently launched in November of 2021, their storage optimized instances. Uh, previous to that, you know, the storage that was actually attached to these Graviton instances was either very small or you were relying upon uh, EBS and persistent disk, which you know, comes with its own kind of performance impact and, and sort of cost along with that as well. So, um, but you know, in November 2021, an, uh, a few different instances were uh, you know, were actually um, introduced that you know added a, a large amount of storage to the systems, and those are going to be the instances that we're really going to be focusing on today. Graviton three also you know, is just was just released last uh, month. Uh, and they first showed up in the C7G instances. You know, we we're interested in seeing what, what that sort of does and the additional performance that you know, we might get out of those instances or out of this Graviton 3 architecture. But um, you know, they haven't made their way into the storage optimized instances just quite yet. So you know, typically this is a, a pretty you know, uh, similar thing that Amazon does across multiple instances where they start with like the compute where the compute optimize instances first and then eventually move them down into general and then into uh, also the uh, storage optimize. So, you know, we expect later this year, we'll start seeing them show up in these storage optimize instances as well. So what instances are, you know, do we have available to us that are really, you know, uh, focused on this storage optimization? And it really comes down to the IM4GN instances and the IS4GEN uh, instances. And you can see that you know, you're, you're getting a large amount of storage uh, on a per instance basis. Really the difference between the, you know, the, the two different instance types or base instance types is the amount of cores that you're getting for the storage and also uh, memory. The other key thing is really the networking too as well. You know, we can see the IM4GNs, you know, we, we are getting, um, you know, you're, you're at the four extra large, uh, you're, you're able to, uh, you know, have guaranteed networking, and you're able to go, you know, a fair bit higher, all the way up to 100 gigabits per second. Whereas with the IS4GNs, you know, this is more focused with, uh, you know, workloads that might be less CPU intensive, but still have a requirement for a lot of local storage. So, you know, really just a, a ratio change from, you know, from one side to the other. And 
know, just to quickly talk, touch upon the x86 side of things um, and the different types of uh, process, you know, instance types that we're going to be using there. Uh, we'll talk very, very briefly about i3. Um, you know, this is the i3 instances were some of the early storage optimized instances that Amazon, uh, uh, you know, had introduced. Uh, these are based on Broadwell and introduced back in 2017. We'll be doing most of our comparisons against the i3 EN, which is Sky Lake or Cascade Lake. Um, and these were back in 2019. These are kind of the default instances that, you know, we run Red Panda on, um, and, you know, pretty regularly. And, you know, a lot of different databases, uh, you know, typically default to i3 EN um, and also a number of different, you know, storage heavy uh, applications, you know, typically rely upon that. I, I have also done a, a, we have a little bit of a comparison with the i4i instances, which are Ice Lake introduced this year. Uh, these are kind of interesting, you know, the performance, at least from an IO perspective is pretty amazing. Um, you know, there are some downsides to the i4i instances and I'll talk about that as we get a little bit further in the presentation. But then the other thing to really kind of take note is that, you know, as I was mentioning earlier on the ARM side, you know, we're gonna see vCPUs and that's a hyper-threading core or a hyper-threaded core that we're going to get. So, you know, we're not talking, it's, so it's always interesting doing this comparison of, you know, we're talking a comparison of cores to hyper-threaded cores uh, in, you know, when we're comparing the instance types. And, you know, just to kind of quickly touch upon like what we have there, you know, we can see the I4I instances. We actually are a little, you know, the, the storage ratio is a little bit lower. Um, you know, we're, we're getting probably half the size as what we would see with the I4, uh, or the IS4 instances. Um, but, you know, you can, you know, with the I4I instances, you know, we are, uh, you know, getting uh, uh, the AWS Nitro SSDs. And then looking at the I3EN instances, you know, we have more storage per instance, um, but it is using kind of a, a slower chip or, or kind of a, a last generation um, uh, CPU architecture. And, you know, we are getting, uh, the disks are a bit slower in comparison to the I4I instances. So before we start really digging into the benchmark itself, um, you probably have the question of, you know, if you're not familiar with Red Panda, probably one of your questions is, you know, what is Red Panda? And why am I wearing a shirt with a lot of Red Pandas on it? Um, so what Red Panda is, is it's a streaming data platform uh, and it's fully Kafka API compatible. So if you're familiar with Kafka, you've run any kind of Kafka workloads or you know, run anything against the Kafka API, uh, Red Panda can actually uh, be a drop-in replacement for Kafka for those particular workloads. Now, where we differ in Kafka is, you know, we are uh, really focused on modern hardware. Uh, so, you know, we're fully written in C++, uh, making use of, uh, you know, a number of optimizations and, and things like, you know, making use of XFS as a file system for, you know, doing out-of-order writes and pre-allocation. We're really focused on low latency in comparison to, you know, Kafka is typically really focused on higher throughput. We can do high throughput, but we can also do low latency too as well. Uh, and we're able to do this typically with a you know, large reduction in overall hardware. We have, uh, we're much simpler to use or pretty, uh, pretty simple to use platform, a uh, single binary. So, you know, easy to get this up and running or to deploy it yourself, also to run it locally within your system, you know, no external dependencies at all. So you don't have to run this with, uh, you know, any sort of like etcd or zookeeper or anything from that standpoint. We also really focus on doing uh, F syncs after every batch of messages. So this is where you know these types of instances are very interesting to us because they handle a large amount of IOPS, uh, and so you know we can actually do IOPS very quickly. Uh, you know your your sort of p fiftieth latency on these types of uh, IOPS are you know within the microseconds versus you know persistent storage could be in the mic uh, in the milliseconds. So. You know, for us, like this, these types of uh, benchmarks and doing these performance comparisons is really critical for us. And, you know, we also do use Raft behind the scenes. Uh, so we are a Raft based system. So this allows us to write out, you know, partial failures uh, of an environment and also provides more predictable performance and other replication mechanisms, as this allows us to have, you know, one slow uh, follower in the system and not have that affect the overall replication and latency of the, the system itself. The one other key thing that we have inside of Red Panda that is, uh, you know, makes us scale or makes this possible for us to scale on modern work or modern machines is something called C-Star. 
So Steesar is a framework. Uh, it's a you know a framework and library uh, that's fully written in C plus plus. It provides a um, you know really kind of an async programming model. So you can kind of think of this as you know th this was sort of uh, put out there before IO urine was a uh, you know really sort of popular. Uh, and you know we get that question quite often of like the, how does C star compare with IO urine? Uh, you know they are very similar in many ways. But uh, this allows us to do things like futures and promises. The other thing that this provides us is the ability to do a thread per core architecture, where uh, what Red Panda does is that when it first starts up on a system, it will look to see how many cores we have available, and then it will spin out that many threads and will pin a thread to a given core. So this eliminates any kind of locking or global locks that occur because we're pretty much treating every core as if it's its own system in a way. Um, this minimizes any sort of IO blocking and reduces overall context switching that you might have within the system. So this works really well with ARM because you know we are getting physical cores and we're not being you know we're not on a hyper-threaded core that that might potentially be context switched as well. So this type of architecture actually lends itself quite well to the ARM um, you know to the ARM uh, type of deployment. And just to kind of show like you know some of the uh, you know that we are performance oriented. This is some of the benchmarking that we've done previously with uh, Kafka in comparison to Red Panda. Uh, this was running on a three node i3 EN six extra large instances doing 500 megabytes per second. And you know, as you can see, Red Panda is around two, you know, two, three milliseconds of latency on average. Uh, and our tell latencies, you know, stay very consistent all the way out to the end uh, in comparison to Kafka, which, you know, Kafka, if you're not familiar with, is all Java based. Um, so it has a, a little bit of a ch more challenging time uh, fully optimizing IO or doing fast IO. Um, so you know, there, it, you can see that kind of goes through on the latency side of things where we're seeing an increase in overall latency and an increase in the overall tell latencies in the system. And you know, with those types of optimizations and being able to have this reduced amount of latency, this really uh, helps us reduce the overall footprint of Red Panda. So, uh, you know, we've had many instances where people have gone, been able to go from 50 node Kafka clusters to seven node Red Panda clusters, uh, just because of the optimizations that uh, we, and my apologies, my computer decided to, um, to take me out of presentation mode, uh, where we have seen that, uh, you know, we've been able to reduce the amount of, um, uh, the amount of infrastructure really needed for uh, you know, for Kafka to Red Panda, where we we're able to reduce the number of nodes, and with this reduction, you know, we bring down the overall cost of running a system like this, and also you know, reduce the overall amount of infrastructure and power needed for you know a, a system like this to be able to do the same exact workload with better latencies. So enough about Red Panda. Let's get into the meat of things. But you know, I wanted to give that kind of context of why uh, you know we would really care about this and why you would look at using Red Panda as um, you know something for investigating you know how Graviton instance types work in comparison to x86. But first, before we can actually do that, you know, we had to also uh, port our C++ code over to ARM. Um, so to make that work, you know, uh, Red Panda is fully written in C++. You know, we thought for sure as we were going through this exercise last year, you know, we were going to have to add some macros to the code or, or you know, do some uh, specific things to make this work. But all we ended up having to do was to really just change the architecture uh, that was used to actually compile the code. So we changed it from, uh, you know, going with uh, AMD 64 to just ARM V8. Um, and this just worked out of the box with actually no code changes needed on the C++ side. What also really helped here is that we vendor all our third-party dependencies and build them ourselves. So CSTAR, as I was mentioning earlier, we actually vendor that uh, specifically and build CSTAR as kind of part of the build process for Red Panda. So uh, we're able to you know, recompile the, all the libraries and all the dependencies into, uh, onto the ARM framework and just make this work uh, seamlessly. Cool. So now getting into the kind of the benchmarking. So what did we look at? You know, we wanted to do data intensive, uh, we're data intensive workloads and show the demands that that puts on both the disk and the network. So we actually tested a, a few different areas. Um, 
it says three, but it's actually four, but we focus on disk bandwidth, we focus on ingestion throughput, bandwidth uh, regulation, which or regulator behavior, which I'll talk about in a little bit detail at the very end, which was kind of an interesting oddity that we saw. And then also into end latency as well as, you know, it's always good to sort of focus on, you know, what does this actually look like when we're talking into in latency in a system? And the two systems, you know, the two ones that we really focused on from an instance type is the I3N that I mentioned, the IS4 GEN as well. So without further ado, let's get into what the results for this look like. So the first ones, uh, you know, we we did the disk bandwidth to see, you know, what could we possibly get from a bytes, you know, gigabytes per second um, standpoint. So, uh, you know, first off, we just used FIO. So just doing something as simple as, uh, you know, 16 kilobyte block sizes. So, uh, you know, that is critical to note. Uh, Red Panda itself, uh, our system, the reason why we go 16 kilobyte block sizes is that that's typically the amount of data that we persist on a per IO operation. Uh, we, um, you know, we chunk our data into 16 kilobyte writes. So, you know, doing this kind of gives us a pretty good comparison of what it's going to do when it, you know, we were running Red Panda on the system. Doing direct IO and then using libAIO uh, for the IO engine for this. And then also making sure that we keep the IO depth uh, you know, the, the buffer is full as we go through this, as that's something that's also done inside of Red Panda uh, for further optimization. So you can see here that, you know, the i3EN 12 extra large is about equivalent to the IS4GEN 8 extra large. Uh, and, you know, the, the comparison down the line is pretty similar. As we start to get into some of the smaller instances, we can see that the i3EN uh, uh, instances do pull out a little bit more. Um, but you know you are also you have more cores in those machines uh, in comparison to the IS four GNs for the amount of uh, data that you have. But once we actually move up into some of the larger instances, uh, you know we can absolutely see that you know they're they're very equivalent with the amount of data um, or the gigabytes per second that can be put through on those instance types. So the next test that we did is that we actually installed Red Panda on the different nodes. Um, and then we used the tool from LibRD Kafka, which is kind of the de facto or one of the de facto Kafka libraries out there today. It's a C++ library that's used by, or behind the scenes by a number of different um, uh, drivers out there, whether you're using like a Python driver or other things from that perspective. And, they actually have a tool within LibRD Kafka called uh, RD Kafka Performance that can do um, you know can do throughput or producing to the machine. So we had uh, we were just doing producing to these uh, systems. So we're just producing data do it to it using client machines that were C six I eight extra large instances using a one kilobyte message size. So you know this chart looks very similar to our previous chart. There's not a huge amount of difference. You know, we're, we're talking about maybe a couple, uh, you know, hundreds of megabytes, uh, if that, when it, you know, in the comparison between these systems. So, you know, not a huge amount of comparison difference between the two. But when things get, where things get a lot more interesting for us is when we actually start to look at the cost factor to this. So the way that we did this was we actually uh, looked at gigabytes per second for hours per dollar. So how, you know, how much gigabytes per second can I get on a per instance basis per the cost of that instance itself? And when I look at it, when we look at it from that perspective, we see that the IS 4GNs have quite the advantage here. Um, you know, they're able to, uh, you know, to get us about a 20% better value in comparison to the I3EN instances. So, you know, this is, this is, pretty fantastic to, to be able to see a 20% improvement uh, you know, from a cost perspective and still be able to get the same level of performance uh, you know, is, uh, is pretty phenomenal. The other thing that we saw through some of our testing, so we were also testing on some I3 instances and looking at some smaller instances. You know, we're always interested in how small individual or you know, how small of an instance can we run Red Panda on? Uh, as we have customers that run us in sort of IoT devices or edge devices where they only have one core available or other things from that perspective. And so, you know, we did some testing on the smallest instances, the i3 large, um, and also on the IS4GN large. And one of the things that we noticed was that 
there was a, a, a kind of a, a, a smoothing of throughput over this system. This should actually be timed down here and not gigabytes per second per dollar. But um, what you can see is that this is the amount of data that was able to be pushed through. And we see with the I3 large instances that this spikes at times and then just drops down to zero. And where with the IS4GN, there was a better regulation or kind of you know, regulator smoothing uh, that was happening uh, within it, the environment that allowed for a more consistent uh, uh, throughput of that system. So, you know, providing sort of a more consistent performance uh, versus, you know, sort of the spiky behavior uh, that we saw with, uh, you know, some of the other smaller instances, specifically the I3 large instance. There are also other factors to consider here. You know, we are mostly focused on in this particular benchmark storage and you know, uh, really sort of network. And, you know, we can look at the different instance types of like, what are we paying when it comes, or, you know, what is the value that we're getting from like the amount of uh, vCPUs? And, you know, this makes it a little challenging because, you know, for the IS4GNs, vCPUs is the same as cores, uh, which is not the case on the I3EN instances. And we can also see like, you know, what are we getting from a value perspective for uh, the amount of gigabytes per dollar that, that is spent? Uh, or for the, you know, sort of the cost factor that's spent and also for memory and for uh, network. And in this comparison, you know, larger numbers are better because um, that means that we're getting more for our money uh, versus, you know, the smaller number is, uh, you know, a, a bit less. So what, we're, what we see across the board is that for the IS4GN instances, we have 17% additional SSD capacity, 18% more guaranteed network capacity, um, you know, we are getting a bit more memory uh, on the I3EN instances, and we are also getting a bit more uh, from a vCPU perspective. But, you know, the, the things that really focus or that are really critical for us in our systems is network and disk. Uh, and for streaming systems, that's typically the, the case. So, you know, this is actually a, a great sort of outcome for us um, for a, a system like Red Panda. So now on to end-to-end -to -end latency. So using the same system that or kind of the same benchmarking tool that I was mentioning earlier, the open messaging benchmark, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a framework that is used for doing comparisons of different stream processing engines. So, you know, if you're comparing a, um, you know, RabbitMQ to Kafka uh, or to uh, Pulsar, you know, open messaging benchmark, you know, it is a Linux foundation project I would highly recommend take a look at it. We have our own fork within um, Red Panda as well that just has uh, you know, the specific Red Panda drivers and, and deployment scripts and things like that inside of it that you can take a look at as well uh, inside of our GitHub repo. But I wanted to do a, uh, we also wanted to do a, a benchmark of just what the end-to-end -end latency would look like for a few different instance types. So going across the board, I kind of wanted to stay right around the $1,000 per node cost basis. Uh, this is the you know, cost for running inside of uh, US East 2 um, with uh, just doing on demand with no sort of cost savings or anything from that perspective. And this is a one node monthly price uh, on a per instance basis here. So I wanted to look at the I4Is because I, I found them kind of interesting. You know, they are sort of a, you know, a, a number of uh, you know, Redis and ScyllaDB had uh, been referenced as talking about their, their performance and some of the benchmarks that they had done on it. So, you know, really kind of focused on the, the high uh, IO uh, space. And then also bringing in the IM4GN and then the IS4GN2 extra large, and then the I3EN3 extra large, which is what we compared, uh, you know, in a similar fashion to the IS4GN2 extra large. And we can see here, they're all pretty comparable in price. The IS4GN2 extra large is definitely, you know, the cheapest option. And we can see that, you know, the IM4GN4 extra large is a little bit more expensive than our I3N3 extra large. But one of the key things to note here is it's a guaranteed 25 gigabits per second of networking, which is pretty fantastic for uh, AWS. Um, whenever you see up to 25 gigabits per second in AWS, uh, what my experience has been is that that typically means you get 25 gigabits per second for, you know, around eight to 10 minutes, and then you get throttled anywhere between eight to 12 gigabits per second uh, for the remainder of the hour. So 
you know, it, it, you have to always do your testing with iPerf and other things from that perspective to fully understand what this really means. Um, but it is always great when you can have this guaranteed amount of networking throughput. So you can take that guessing game out of, you know, is it the network? Am I running out of credits on my network uh, connection? And, you know, not having to use that as, or have that as another point of investigation for these systems. So what does this look like? So this is the output from the open messaging benchmark. We were running a workload of 750 megabytes per second of throughput, one kilobyte message size. I had two client machines running, so two M5 and four extra larges. And here, you know, this is the average end-to-end -end latency of the system. Um, we, um, you know, for uh, the I for I instances, you can see that you know that provided us the best overall performance. Um, and then you know the second uh, sort of the second uh, contender in there was the IM4GN instance, where you know pretty pretty close. Uh, and you know that these this was a test that was run for uh, an hour, or we ran these you know all of the tests for an hour. Uh, you know we can see that it's pretty very close to what we saw with the I4I I instances. Uh, and then also the I3 EN 3 extra large, uh, you know, is uh, is in third place here. And then the IS4 GN 2 extra large, uh, you know, comes out still in a pretty good respectable latency overall, but, you know, definitely, um, it, you know, suffers a little bit based upon the fact that, you know, we have reduced number of, of cores in comparison to the other systems. So, and one thing to kind of really note here too, uh, going back to the instance types and what we just saw from, you know, the overall performance is, you know, the I4I gives us the best performance, but only has half the amount of storage in comparison to all the rest of the instances. So, um, you know, even though it can, uh, the storage is pretty amazing. And some of the testing I did on the storage, I was able to, you know, for this instance type, the I4I 4 extra large, I was able to see 120,000 IOPS um, per second, uh, or uh, yeah, 120,000 IOPS on a single drive there and also two gigabytes per second of throughput, which is amazing. But the challenge with that is that the network couldn't keep up with the actual drive performance. So, you know, having a system where you might be very IO intensive, but not have to do a lot of uh, network IO, you know, the I4Is are very interesting in that regard, but, you know, for Red Panda itself and for other systems where you are uh, focusing on both disk and network, you know, the IM4GN in this case, um, you know, really does well and is a, you know, is a, is a great contender. Also, it's really important to look at what the end percentile latencies are kind of, uh, you know, what, what the uh, tail latencies of the system look like. So we can see here that, you know, the I4I and the IM4GN are pretty, you know, are, are pretty much neck and neck in that regard. And we see a little bit higher latencies with the I3 uh, EN3 extra large, and then the highest latencies with uh, the IS4 GN2 extra large. And that's to be expected as, you know, we have half the cores in the IS4 GN2 extra large in comparison to the I, you know, IM4 GN. If we go back to here, we can see it's even, uh, you know, we have half of the amount of cores from one system to the other in the comparison of the two. So what does this really tell us? This tells us that, you know, the IM4 GN4 extra large, you know, provides a, a great balance between sort of performance and cost and overall storage capability. Um, and then the I4I instance is interesting. Uh, you know, we, it is something that we'll probably, you know, ourselves here at Red Panda will do a bit more investigation into because uh, for cases where, you know, we want to have the highest amount of IO throughput and then maybe age out data to something like S3 or to an object store, uh, you know, the I4I instances might make sense. But again, you know, it always goes back to network IO. So, you know, if we're doing operations back to S3, we might cut into our network and then might not be able to even take full advantage of what's available from a disk perspective. So, you know, if you're running database operations where there's compactions and other things happening quite often, the I4I instance might make sense. But, you know, in general, it, it you know, you might not be able to actually make full use of the IO available of the disks themselves uh, if you can't drive it enough from a networking standpoint. And then the IM 4GN for extra larges, you know, we had that seven terabytes of disk space for 1,065 per month uh, in comparison to, uh, you know, the I4I 4 extra larges where it's just, you know, half the amount of storage um, for, you know, about $1,000 a month. So, you know, it, it kind of, a, you know, always interesting to sort of see the difference of, you know, what are you going to get from a price performance standpoint and the, um, 
you know, the, the overall outcome of what that looks like when you're actually looking at the int and latency of the system itself. So what, you know, what are our conclusions and how do we, you know, how do we summarize all this at the end of the day? So as we saw in some of the earlier tests, you know, the ARM instances have that 20% advantage in price performance. Um, you know, we see smoother regulations on the smaller instances. So, you know, I think it's really clear that for these smaller instances running with the ARM processes or the ARM processor is, you know, is absolutely a great way to go. Uh, as you get, you know, sort of more predictable performance and, uh, you know, you, you're getting a, a pretty, you know, a pretty good ratio of price and performance with those smaller instances. So, you know, if I was running any kind of smaller workloads, I would really look to, to run that on ARM today. And then the IM 4G and 4 large provides a great price performance comparison for end to end latency. And, you know, the I4I instances are still relatively new, uh, you know, still worth a little more investigation. Um, but, you know, definitely some concerns there that they're not enough network to really help or to really drive the, uh, you know, the full amount of um, IO that's available on those systems. So, so with that, I'll take a quick look on, um, you know, what some of the questions are. Uh, so all, one of the questions is, you know, are we, what kind of AWS storage instance types are we using? Uh, they are all SSD and VME backed. So we, we didn't want to, um, we didn't really want to look at uh, any HTTP based back systems because uh, we were, you know, really kind of focused on like what we could do or what could we drive from a IO perspective. And, uh, you know, you're going to get the best IO and the best latencies from using local NVMe SSD storage. We do use GCC for compiling. Uh, I, I, in, well, we have uh, multiple different ways in which we can compile Red Panda. Uh, you know, LLVM and CLang is, is one of them. Um, you know, we do have more information. If you actually go to our GitHub repo, you can find how exactly where, uh, you know, how to compile Red Panda. It is, Red Panda itself is a source available. So you can go and download it and compile it locally. And, you know, we have all the build scripts within the, uh, within the repo itself. So the features of the ARM processors that contributed to the ingest and throughput results, you know, it, what we saw was that, you know, we didn't really, we didn't do a huge amount of performance comparison on what we could do or, you know, what we saw from a IO or sorry, a CPU perspective, but what we wanted to really comp uh, compare was, you know, we're, uh, were we, you know, the amount of CPU that we had available for being able to drive the full amount of IO. Um, Cause you know, for us, what's really critical is to make sure that we have enough IO uh, or enough CPU processing to be able to drive the IO of the system. And that was really the, the key thing that we saw with this is that, you know, what was that, what was that, uh, you know, of the ARM architecture, uh, and these ARM instances provided by Amazon, you know, what best uh, sort of, you know, throughput and, and network uh, IO could we get? And that was really the, the, the point of this comparison to really see, uh, you know, what could we see in comparison to sort of the standard Intel instances. And, you know, as we, uh, the conclusion as was I was showing is that, you know, we can absolutely drive the IO and network with the number of cores that are available there. Uh, you know, typically it's being done with less amount of cores and that provides us, you know, that, that, that 20% um, uh, sort of value savings over what we see with Intel. So, you know, we're able to, um, you know, get consistent performance that can drive full IO optimization of these instances. So there's a question around uh, with the bandwidth regulator, is this, uh, this seems to be something that was added as part of the Graviton 2 instances. There wasn't a huge amount of information really presented by AWS of what was happening in this regard. This was more just an observation that we had made in the systems of, you know, the comparison of what we saw with the i3 large instances and with AWS. You know, as anyone who's done performance testing in AWS uh, realizes is that a lot of the times it's a bit of a guessing game, understanding, you know, what exactly is happening behind the scenes. Am I running into, you know, am I running out of credits for the particular network? 
um, you know, uh, you know, network for the particular instance that I'm running on, or uh, you know, how are they splitting up a SSD disk across multiple uh, instances? Because if we go back and look at sort of the the in the earlier part of the presentation, and look at some of these instance types. I, you know, especially for like the i3EN, uh, uh, i3EN instances, you know, your standard drive is 7.5 terabytes. So when we're looking at these really small instances, you know, we're having that drive be split up across multiple uh, instances. And at that point, you know, there, there has to be uh, some type of regulation in place to, you know, not allow you to make full use of, you know, all the IO capabilities of that underlying device and have it be split up evenly across multiple tenants or multiple instances are making up that drive. So, you know, uh, AWS does a number of kind of different tricks behind the scenes to uh, try to help with that. And we just saw that in general, um, you know, the in the ARM instances, especially the smaller ARM instances where there is a, uh, you know, sharing of the underlying drive across multiple instances, that this regulation was much smoother than what we saw with some of the other uh, older instances. So it's it's hard to say what that's exactly attributed to, but just something to be aware of as you run on these types of instances inside of AWS. Great. I think that's all the questions that I see here uh, at the end. Um, you know, if there's any further questions about uh, about Red Panda and what we've done here, you know, feel free to come and uh, join our Slack channel, you know, ask questions there. Uh, we have a pretty you know active Slack community. Uh, you can always reach out to us and we're happy to share a little bit more details around Red Panda and some of the testing that we've done on the different instance types. Uh, we also have uh, this actually, a lot of this data came from a blog post uh, that you'll find on our website too as well, where we have uh, you know a lot of this information published in a blog format uh, that you can check out after the fact. And I think uh, is also being posted in the, uh, in the chat as well. So you can take a look at, and uh, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that concludes uh, this webinar for me. And uh, thank you so much for your time and for your questions. And uh, I appreciate uh, your attention. Thank you so much, Rocco, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.